Ahoy ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Stefan Zweig's novella The Royal Game. This is a story about the most thrilling of sports, the royal game of chess, and it is not for the faint of heart. Today's cast are the nameless narrator who bears some similarities with the author, he's Austrian for once. Then there's the reigning world chess champion, Milko Centovic, a man like a chess computer, both ingenious and bare of emotions, mysterious Dr. B from Austria as well, and finally we mention the Scottish oil tycoon McConnor, who's responsible for paying the bills. Stefan Zweig was born in Vienna in 1881 into a Jewish family. He made quite a career as a writer after World War I, but when National Socialism was on the rise, he was forced to emigrate in 1934, first to England, later to Brazil. The Royal Game was his last work. Shortly after its completion in 1941, he committed suicide together with his wife. Now the novella starts on a passenger ship, leaving New York, heading for Buenos Aires. Wow, there's Milko Chantovic, the world chess champion aboard. Really? I absolutely want to meet him. You won't get lucky there, I'm afraid. He's really quite antisocial. His foster father, a priest, had already given up on him. Seemed to be just a little dumb. But when he was sitting at a game of chess with a pal one evening, what? Last rights? Uh, I need to run. Um, I'll be back in a minute. And the pal goes, well, Milko, you want to finish the game? And Milko glances and goes, check. What? And the foster father comes back and goes, oh, chess genius. And it took Milko just a couple of days to outplay all the chess nerds in the province. He went to Vienna and started a professional career and now he's a world chess champion, but he's really a greedy freak. The narrator's friend seems to have been right in his judgment. Centovic runs around the promenade deck like mad once a day, then he buries himself in his cavern again, bent over the chessboard. I'll set him a trap with the help of my wife, hi there, who can barely play chess. Excuse me? But we'll just sit in front of a chessboard, someone will certainly look on. Oh chess, do you mind if I watch? Then McConnor crops up and goes, I wanna play you. Naturally, the wife is then right out of it again. The two of them play each other and at one point Centovic actually does stop, looks and moves on again. Well, amateurs like ourselves are not worthy of the champion's attention. What champion? Well, Centovic, world chess champion. Really? I've got to play him. He won't get lucky there, but McConnor dashes after him, then comes back and goes, you were right, he was really quite impolite, but for $250 he's gonna play, you know, yes, uh, tomorrow afternoon. You are paying him? So then actually an arranged chess match takes place in the steamship's smoking room. Many enthusiasts have gathered around McConnor and the narrator and Centovic goes, I'd play the lot of you simultaneously, but unfortunately there's not enough chess boards aboard, so I will play you collectively. Ten minutes per move. The match is a little one-sided. Centovic glances briefly on the board, makes his move and then stands around in a board manner in a corner, while the collective intellect of his opponents tries to figure out the perfect next move. Then he looks again and within a brief time he goes, check, and McConnor, return match! with pleasure. The second match, however, threatens to go just like the first one when suddenly someone interferes and goes, stop that move for the love of God, when McConnor just wants to move a piece. It is almost exactly the same constellation as Alyechin against Bogolyubov, 1922. Right, and what would you have us do now? Evade, parry, defend, maybe we'll manage a tie game. Now Centovic makes exactly the move that was predicted by the mysterious chess crack. Then he goes into his corner again and he goes, and now pressure forward, at which point the champion becomes attentive. He even sits down at the table he'd only be standing before, and after seven moves he goes, tie, yes. Do the gentleman wish for another? Another match. Yes, of course, but now you'll only play this gentleman here. No, sorry, I haven't played a game of chess in 25 years. Bye. And the narrator, what do you know, and Shintovich, well, that was interesting, that's why I gave him a chance. I'll be here tomorrow at three o'clock again, and he leaves. Now the narrator wants to find out what this was, and follows him outside and introduces himself. Hello, Dr. B. Oh, a well-known honorable family, there was a personal doctor of the Kaiser, wasn't there? Can't I tempt you to play against the champion? What champion? Well, Shintovich, the world chess champion. Really? Uh, yes, I'd like to, but I really haven't touched a chess piece since school. Excuse me, you must have studied the game, really. Well, it's a long story. Do you have time? Of course, do tell. Well, I used to work as a lawyer. We did asset management for many monasteries and even the royal family of Austria. Then the National Socialists came. They had planted a spy in our firm, but I had spotted that and succeeded in saving nearly everything in time. Then they arrested me. They didn't take me to a concentration camp, but to a hotel. Ridiculous, isn't it? They took me to a hotel room at Hotel Metropole. I had a bed, a chair, a table, hot meals, but I was absolutely isolated, except when they took me to questioning. They wanted to get at the money that we had handled, and I had to be extremely focused to give away as little as possible. I stayed in this hotel for months, and a time came when I was down and out. I was afraid to go mad. They took me to questioning again. I have to wait for hours on end, and I see a wardrobe. There's a book in the pocket of that army coat. I must have that. I needed mental food, you know. God, I hope it's poetry. So I stole it. I smuggled it back to my hotel room, looked at it, and it was the greatest chess matches of all time. No!
Well, I still devoured it. I learned all the 150 matches by heart and played them again and again in my head. That gave me strength for many weeks and months and made me keep up. But then, oh god, I need new matches! I'll play against myself now! You cannot imagine the computing power it took my brain to achieve this feat. I was absolutely obsessed with chess. One half of my brain was white, the other was black. No, can't come to questioning now in the middle of a game! What? Make your move, you bloody fool! Then I collapsed. When I awoke, I found myself in a hospital. Where am I? Remain lying, please. You had a severe nerve irritation. Are you doing chemistry? Uh, no. Why? Because you were talking formula. C3, C4. No, that was chess. Oh, chess poisoning. I see. Well, be careful. Your uncle was the Kaiser's personal doctor. You are safe with me. And this good doctor saw to it that I was released and allowed to leave Austria, which I did at once. So here I am on a ship on the Atlantic and suddenly I stumble across a game of chess. It was a reflex, really. I couldn't help interfering. No, it was very interesting. Don't expect too much when I play tomorrow. I'll only play one match, lest I suffer from a relapse into chess poisoning. Of course! So the arranged match actually takes place the next day in the smoking room. This time Dr. B faces Centovic, the champion. There are quite a lot of spectators who want to look on. Chentovich is absolutely absorbed by the chessboard, doesn't seem to perceive anything else around him, while Dr. B is really quite relaxed and lively. After the opening, the champion gets slower and slower, which really gets on Dr. B's nerves. The match drags along until finally... Yes! Done with that! Dr. B paces the room as he did in his hotel prison cell. Chentovich broods over the chessboard and goes, Capitulate. Yes! Another match? Of course! But the narrator, excuse me, isn't that too exhausting? You said you only wanted to play one match. Exhausting? I could have played 17 matches at the same time. And Chentovich realizes that he can drive Dr. B mad with his exceeding slowness, so he slows down even more and Dr. B goes, Go on and make your move, man! We said 10 minutes and stop that devil's tattoo on the table. Dr. B gets more and more stressed out until he finally goes, Check! I don't see check. Does anyone else of the gentleman? That's because the kings in the rock play actually all the pieces are... Remember. Oh, oh my god, I have mixed up this game with one of the 17 other matches in my head. Stop the match. Yes, this was nonsense. You have won. I will never play again. And he leaves. And McConnor, who's paid, shouts, Damn fool! Pity. He was very gifted for an amateur. And so the cold and greedy technocrat defeats the passionate genius. If one takes this as a metaphor for the world's condition in 1941, one might get the, an idea why Zweig didn't want to inhabit it any longer. And this dear congregation was the Royal Game by Stefan Zweig.